everyone, I'm cinematographer and time loss photographer Drew Geraci and I've got a little secret for you. I am not a Mac user and I haven't been one for almost a decade. Uh, back in 2013, Apple lost me with their Mac Pro trash can and I've been a PC user ever since. And honestly, I haven't looked back at all until the release of the new MacBook Pro M1 Max, what we have right here. Um, before we start, so you don't have to skip all the way to the end of the video, I'm going to go ahead and just tip my hat to Apple because they finally designed a laptop for professionals and you actually get the performance that you pay for as much as it pains me to say it. Uh, I think though, for the longest time though, this hasn't been the case for Apple. Uh, so I'm a little reluctant to say it's better than what I'm currently using, uh, which is the Dell Precision 5750 and 5760, but it is a 100% improvement for Apple users. And in the end, I think both Apple and Windows folks are really gonna benefit from the competition that will undoubtedly spur from this. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the new MacBook Pro M1X and how it actually compares to the Dell Precision 5760. Let's go ahead and talk specs. This is the M1 Max 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU with 64 gigs of RAM and eight terabytes of SSD. Its MSRP is $6,100 and it's the highest tier MacBook Pro that's out there. Our challenger is the Dell Precision 5760 with six core Intel Xeon CPU, six gigabytes NVIDIA RTX A6000 GPU, 64 gigs of RAM and four terabytes of SSD. This particular model can be configured up to eight cores, but the six core is all that was available to test at the time. This configuration's MSRP is $5,500. While the MacBook Pro has a four core advantage in this test, you'll see that the Dell Precision 5760 is no slouch, even though it is at a disadvantage before we start. Both of these are priced in a similar MSRP range though, so we'll continue. Before we get into the benchmarks, and you can skip ahead if you want to the time codes below in the description, we're gonna first look at both models' design and form factor. For starters, the new MacBook Pro resembles more of its original counterpart from the early 2010s. It's a bit bulky, not overly sleek looking, and looks pretty generic and uninspiring in most cases. The build quality has sort of a plasticky feel to it, but what it lacks in looks, it does make up for in ports. The new models now boast three Thunderbolt 4 USB-C ports, as well as an SD card reader, full-size HDMI, and a mic jack. The power is now provided by a MagSafe charger, which I do love, and the touch bar has been completely removed, thankfully. The Dell Precision line resembles more of what the older, newer MacBook Pros look like from just a year ago, it has a stylish carbon fiber matte finish to it at its base, and looks quite modern. The Precision boasts four Thunderbolt 4 USB-C ports, as well as a headphone jack and SD card reader. It does lack the full-size HDMI port that the MacBook Pro has, but Dell does include for free a USB-C to HDMI plus USB-A adapter, which is really nice as much as I don't like dongles. Both systems, in my opinion, have great port options and they both function well in that regard, so it's a draw. As far as looks though, I definitely prefer the look of the Dell Precision, but that's all subjective. We'll now move on to screen quality and color replication of each model. The new MacBook Pro M1 Max offers a maximum resolution of 3456 by 2234 with 1000 nits up to 120 hertz, which does look quite nice when viewing. The screen isn't technically 4K though, as it's around 400 pixels shy of that. I wasn't able to test any of the color space percentages either, and finding any technical information on the MacBook Pro is quite limited, so I really didn't know how well it handles different color spaces like Adobe RGB or DCI P3. There also seems to be no way to professionally calibrate the monitor currently, so that's disappointing, and definitely a limiting factor if you're looking to have a color accurate screen. Apple does offer some internal calibration tools, but there's no way to see if it's actually producing the correct colors. With the Dell Precision 5760, the monitor is above 4K UHD resolution, coming in at 3840 by 2400 at 500 nits, with a refresh rate of up to 60 hertz. I will say that I do wish this number was a bit higher at 120 hertz, but it does do the job and the image quality looks crisp and vibrant. Testing out the color spaces, the Dell offers 100% of Adobe RGB and 99% of DCI P3 color spaces, which is fantastic for video editing. I was able to confirm these numbers using the Data Color Spider X Pro, which gives me great confidence that these monitors will actually produce color accurate scenes. There's also an option for touchscreen operations, and while I don't use it all the time, it is a neat feature to use. Just make sure you have a microfiber cloth handy to keep it clean because it's gonna get dirty. In this particular challenge, I believe the Dell Precision has the greater advantage, even though the MacBook Pro does have 1000 nits. The screen is able to accurately depict colors, has a higher resolution, and just looking side by side, Apple screens seem to be a bit warmer in tone. 
and when viewing content back adds a splash of yellow or orange tint to almost all of the imagery which I'm not really a fan of, which you can see here in this side by side. Along with the screen comes the bevel, and I have to say Apple's is slightly thicker than Dell's, and Apple does have the black notch at the top of the screen, which is absolutely aggravating, uh, and probably eats up a, a solid 5% of the screen, which means you're losing real estate for windows and apps. Dell's bevel is consistent across the board, and even offers additional space at the bottom of the screen, whereas the Mac doesn't. This is a clear win for the Dell Precision. Both systems play back video in 4K beautifully though, and I will say it's a treat watching both of them at the same time. Regardless of which model you go with, you're going to get great picture quality. Without getting into too much detail, the sound systems on both systems are quite nice. The Apple does offer a more rich and bassy experience though, so I'll give Apple a win for this in that department. The precision sound is still great, but there's a noticeable difference. Now we move on to the benchmarking, and this is where things get interesting. I'm a huge DaVinci Resolve user, as well as After Effects and Premiere Pro in some instances, so we're going to be going over all three of those programs in this comparison. Jumping straight into Resolve, the playback files of the MacBook Pro is impressive. You can switch between any flavor of timeline resolution from 1080p to 8K, and in most instances you'll get 100% real-time playback. The only time the MacBook Pro stuttered in playback was when I introduced any kind of fusion element or if I was trying to decode Cinema DNG with resolutions above 8K. That being said, the experience was great and I think anyone who uses this program will be excited to do so. On the precision side of things, Dell handled most resolutions very similar to the MacBook Pro, but when it came to the playback of 8K RAW on an 8K timeline, the playback quality did stutter and drop frames consistently. That being said, it did handle 8K Sony Alpha 1 files with no issues, which is wonderful considering long op format codecs used to have issues playing back in the past. The winner in playback performance goes to Apple in this case. It really was a treat being able to swiftly move around and not have any stutter or playback issues while viewing the content. And that being said, the Dell also played back most footage back, even at higher resolutions, without any issues. When it comes to render times, this is where things get interesting. And the results were very surprising in some cases, but not in all. I do want to note that I did test 8K Red Raw Helium footage inside of DaVinci Resolve, but there were some discrepancies in render time for both units, uh, and because of that, I decided not to benchmark that particular codec. For the other codecs though, I was able to benchmark in a series of three tests, run consecutively back to back, and the average render time is what is reported. For the Sony Alpha 1, both MacBook Pro and Dell Precision boast impressive render times. The MacBook Pro does offer faster render times though when the unit is off battery as you can see here. For RED 6K RAW footage, the Precision took the lead in render time for both 4K and 1080p renderings, both on and off battery. It's not surprising though considering Resolve does favor CUDA core rendering, which puts the Precision at an advantage. Up next is Sony Venice 6K RAW footage, and on this particular test, both systems performed almost identically, but the MacBook Pro did inch ahead of the Precision when off power. That being said, the render times were incredibly good, especially for Sony RAW, which is usually a harder codec to decode. For the rendering of 9K DNG files from the Sony Alpha 1, the MacBook Pro took a clear lead over the Precision by minutes in some cases. I didn't expect the MacBook Pro to hold up as well as it did. This test is by far the worst for the Precision. One of the most unexpected results of my testing inside of DaVinci Resolve was just how well the MacBook Pro handled the rendering of 4K long op footage with fusion elements added to it. I didn't think it would outperform the precision in this area, but it did, and it did by almost a full minute and 20 seconds. Next we move to Premiere Pro. I'm using the 2022 versions for both systems with the most recent updates and it should be noted that there is a beta version that does perform slightly better for the MacBook Pro, but it wasn't stable enough to test as it kept crashing. Render times, as you'll see, are much more even in this benchmark and in most cases the precision does beat the MacBook Pro. A takeaway from this testing though shows that Adobe's render engine just plain sucks compared to DaVinci Resolve. Where most tests were completed close to what the clip length was of the original source file, Adobe's render times for both units are exaggerated by anywhere from 30 to 80%, which is pretty bad. I hope Adobe addresses this sometime in the future and hopefully rebuilds Premiere from the ground up. Since Adobe Premiere Pro allows for the exporting of ProRes for both machines, I took an opportunity to test it out with 8K Sony Alpha 1 footage and the results were very surprising too, in the sense that the precision held up almost identically to the MacBook Pro, even though the MacBook Pro has a native ProRes encoding. The render times were actually better in ProRes for the precision at 8K, but the MacBook Pro took a slight lead in the 4K and 1080p versions. Overall, my experience inside of Premiere Pro with both systems when it came to playback performance was pretty good. 
but both systems struggled to do full res playback on high resolution AK Plus clips and offered a different, more stuttered experience compared to Resolve. Just for fun, I took a 4K ProRes 422 file and encoded it back to ProRes 422 on both systems, and while I expected the MacBook Pro to have a huge advantage here, the precision was only behind by 5 seconds, which isn't too bad at all. Now we move on to Adobe After Effects. It's something that I use quite often, and there are millions of variables that can really skew performance, so I just used a simple particle-based layer and added a default glow to it, and the render times were actually very surprising again. Both computers finished at nearly the same time, the MacBook Pro only being two seconds faster. The most surprising aspect though was when I introduced complex layering, animation, and particles to the mix on a 1080p export. The MacBook Pro finished the render in 5 minutes and 18 seconds, while the precision took 6 minutes and 20 seconds, more than a minute difference. There was more that I wanted to test inside of After Effects, but because I only had the MacBook Pro for 2.5 days, I had to cut a few of the benchmarks short. The performance inside of After Effects was great for both systems, and I'm really excited to see what happens in the future. The last test I performed on both of these systems was its battery power and usage. This is something that Apple has claimed is the best part of the machine, so I wanted to put it to the test. A little spoiler alert though, the Dell Precision finished almost identically to the MacBook Pro as both units came in at 1 hour and 20 minutes from a full battery to empty. Both were tested under a 100% CPU GPU usage for the entire time, and I was honestly surprised that the Dell lasted as long as it did and kept up with the MacBook Pro even in high performance mode. For general use, mild editing consisting of about 30 to 40 minutes on a timeline, a few renders, and some web browsing, the MacBook Pro lasted for about two and a half hours. The Precision lasted for about two. I didn't try the battery saver mode on either laptop, but I would expect those numbers could be wildly different, but we'll save that for another day. I also want to thank my buddy Scott Selzman for allowing me to use his MacBook Pro over the course of uh, the weekend, so uh, thank you so much for that. I also want to let you know that this isn't sponsored content. Dell and Apple neither paid me nor solicited any kind of information from this, so this is all just for my personal use, uh, and I thought it would be fun to do. That's going to wrap it up, but as you can see, both of these systems perform really well, especially in the 4K and 8K range. So it really doesn't matter if you go for a Windows platform or an Apple platform at this point. Both systems are very much in the same ballpark, and I think that's wonderful. We haven't seen that in a long time. So if you are an Apple user or a Windows user, you're going to get the best performance, which I think is wonderful. I'm going to be sticking with my Dell Precision 5760, but if you're an Apple user, I definitely say go ahead, grab the new uh, Apple M1 Max, and you will not be disappointed. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, just throw them down below. And as always, I know I hate asking, but go ahead, just like and subscribe. It, you know what? Actually, don't like and subscribe. You know what? It's cool. Don't worry about it. But if you do feel like it, I'll be happy to take it. As always, happy shooting, and I'll see you guys soon. Thanks so much.